Welcome. Welcome to our web webcast. There's Brian. Brian, go ahead. Hey, Leonard, thank you very much. Uh, good to see you and Lorena, Mark Bunzel joining us, and Mark Aneto will join us here in just a bit. It is great to be back, isn't it? I know a lot of people have been uh, looking forward to the Wagner Guide webcast coming back, and here we are as things are opening back up uh, north of the border. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Very excited to welcome Mark Aneto in about 10 or 15 minutes as well uh, for his journey up the Columbia River all the way into Idaho. And uh, we had a little preview of this uh, just a few minutes ago. It's pretty cool to see. I think you're going to enjoy that. And Mark Bunzel joining us from a long way away. I mean, you are halfway around the world, my friend. Where are you coming to us from tonight? I am in 80 degrees weather in St. Thomas. Tomorrow I'll be in Tortola. And uh, uh, on Saturday, we start BVI-1 flotilla trip. And then a week later, BVI-2 will be on a, a power catamaran for the first week, a 60-footer with uh, a, a group uh, from uh, Colorado. And then uh, the week number two, we switch boats to a sailing cat. I get to get out there and sail a little bit, which I haven't done in a while. That'll be fun. Wow. And uh, that's courtesy of Voyage Charters and uh, one of their Voyage 500s, beautiful boat. And that group is from the Seattle area. And they're all excited to get down here in the 80 degree weather and snorkeling and everything else. And uh, uh, next week I'll be able to talk and may have a few pictures about some of the fantastic places that we visited. And Brian, it's great to have you here. Uh, many of you don't know that uh, Brian was the voice behind the scenes when we had our podcast, Currents, and uh, uh, did a fantastic job with this. And it, just as a little background, we took a hiatus on uh, Seattle Boat Show Live. Uh, boy, I can't even remember when we stopped. Last, what, October, November? And uh, we reformulated it. And more importantly, we just got inundated with people, especially at the Seattle Boat Show, that were saying, when are you coming back on? You're our Thursday night entertainment, which I thought that was a stretch. Uh, but they said, yeah, we sit there with a glass of wine. And, and what they didn't say is we sit there with a glass of wine and make fun of you. But they didn't say that. So, uh, But they, they said, we really, we really enjoy the show. Bring it back. So we put our heads together and we had an excellent first guest with Mark Aneto, and uh, we uh, chose Brian to uh, be our, our moderator and keep us on the straight and narrow, and also because he has a better voice than I do <laughs> or Leonard and Lorena. So he, he is the voice of the Wagner webcast going forward. So yeah, well, I'm, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate the intro, Mark. You know, um, it, it's a voice, but I also have lots of stupid questions to ask too. So that's you know, I, I'm the guy that can ask all the stupid questions, right? <laughs> the stupid questions have made this show entertaining, especially when we're able to answer them, which is not always true. And the most popular question that I get asked every day, seriously, people call the office, I get emails, when is the border to Canada going to open? So uh, anyway, uh, uh, we're going to touch on that tonight. Lorena's going to going to have uh, information for that. And uh, uh, we'll touch on that every week we have this show as an update. And uh, we'll have more news about this as we go. So uh, we're real pleased. It's going to be a very exciting cruising, cruising season this year. So yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, it's great uh, that you mentioned that. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here with uh, the three of you and the audience, Mark and Neto tonight. Yeah, I'm really flattered to be a part of this because you know, I am the rookie, right? And I, and I, so I've got all that excitement of a new boater to kind of add to this. And we, we had such a great time doing the podcast. I learned so much during that period. And, you know, you could literally open the Wagner guide to any page and, you know, you've got a conversation, right? And it's so amazing for all of us, whether you're new to boating or you've been in it for 20 or 30 years, you're always learning, right? And yeah. and you guys have such incredible expertise. Uh, the way you describe things is really incredible. And so it's just really, I'm really proud to be a part of this and, and looking forward to this webcast series. And I know 
Um, as you mentioned, Mark, one of the, uh, the big things on the agenda for so many people right now is Canada reopening. And after the last couple of years uh, of being pretty much locked down, uh, things are opening up. And, and Lorena, I know you've got an update for us on Hi. what's happening north of the border. So what, what should we know right now about what's going on as far as voting? Well, most voters have heard the good news that starting April 1, we no longer need to have a negative COVID test to enter the waters of BC. And so that's great news. You still are required to be fully vaccinated in order to enter. Uh, a RiveCan app is very important. That's required, it's mandatory to enter all the information into a RiveCan app. It's a free app you can get from Apple or Google. So you will need to enter in your vessel information, food information, proof of vaccination, your passport. You should also have a quarantine plan in case you do become ill. And again, all of that's entered into a RiseCan app. And uh, so uh, have that app and filled out and ready. And if you and Marina, have- Marina, with the app, it asks what your location or your quarantine destination is. And I've been told that that should be the place that you left from. That's correct. It's a little tricky for, for boaters. It's a little different. Obviously, you're not staying in a hotel. You're staying on your boat. So it can be the address of a marina that you're staying at, for example, your first marina. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, if you have children five years and older who might not be considered fully vaccinated, you will need to have proof of vaccination. And uh, Nexus, you may use your Nexus card to enter US waters, but you cannot currently use the Nexus process to enter Canadian waters. So, so you can so, still use it as an ID though, right? Yes, you can use it as an ID and enter that in your Rise Can app, but it's mandatory that if you're coming across by boat that you report to a marine reporting site so a customs clearance site you need to physically go to the site and to get a list of those uh, sites that are currently open you can go online just google small vessel reporting sites and it'll give you a list of uh, the sites that are currently open the cbsa locations some of those, keep in mind, are seasonal. So right now, Bedwell Harbor, for example, is not open. We're keeping an eye on that and hope that it will open later. But we're not sure on that one. Yeah. There's still, they haven't declared whether it's going to be open for the season or not. Uh, Nexus, if you're interested in getting your Nexus card in U.S., uh, U.S. enrollment centers are open in the U.S., but not currently open in Canada. So keep that in mind. And again, uh, you do need to report to a CBSA site when you're entering Canada. Uh, other news, effective March 11th, the mask mandate was lifted in Canada, so you no longer need to wear a mask. And beginning April 8th, uh, you won't have to show your vaccination card to get into restaurants and events and that sort of thing. But of course, you will need your vaccination, proof of vaccination to enter Canada border. So the latest news yeah. on that. Yeah, and I got a couple of updates too, uh, changes here. One of them, I'll do a share screen. Uh, the um, On this one, this is the wrong one. The uh, This one, there. that's a reminder that we have some no-go zones. And this is uh, on San Juan Island is the first one and that's on the west side. And that's a voluntary no-go zone for boats. That's a quarter mile off of the shore. And that one is a voluntary and it's year round. The other ones are seasonal. So they are in effect from June 1st until November 30th. And those are no boats at all. Uh, it doesn't matter what type of boat and uh, you're not allowed to go into those. They're uh, off of Pender Island. That's a quarter mile, uh, excuse me, a half a mile off of Pender Island on the west side of North Pender Island. And then the other one is off of the uh, Southern tip of Saturna Island. And the reason that really that we're highlighting this is that uh, there are reports that uh, last season people were, were cited for that 
don't know what the penalties or the fines were, but uh, there were there were penalties apparently for that. So effective June 1st, we, we have we assume that they're still seasonal. We haven't seen anything for the 2022 season, but uh, in 2021 they were June 1st through November 30th. We assume that's going to be the same, and this is all for whale protection, of course. Uh, and uh, so there, we're assuming that those are going to be in place soon. Uh, the other one to bring your attention is the Swinomish Channel. Uh, and that is going to have the, the the railroad bridge at the north end is going to be closed to vessel traffic. And that'll be closed from April 12th until April 26th. So two weeks uh, from nine until three, nine in the morning until three in the afternoon, the bridge will, they're doing repairs to it and it will not be opening to vessel traffic, not even to emergency vessels as well. You're still allowed to go under it if you have a clearance. The clearance is eight feet underneath that thing. So if you've got a runabout or something, you can still go there. And the last one that's kind of interesting was a local notice to mariners. And that was the picture I had up here. Apparently the uh, US Navy in February was doing an anti-mine exercise and they dropped these uh, inert, these, these dummy mine things in Gastonaw Channel up in Southeast Alaska. And they lost a couple of them. And uh, so they are asking mariners if they happen to see these to uh, let them let the Navy know they're about seven feet long. They weigh about 1400 pounds. So my first observation is that the Navy and their anti anti mine group couldn't find these things in the mud. I'm not sure how we're going to find them at this point, but they're looking for some help on that one. I thought that was a little amusing. And they, there, there is no ammunition in them. There's, they're safe at this point, apparently. So that's our update. I, I thought maybe that was the way you had your slide cycle. That came up first with the no-go zones for whales. So I wondered whether that's how they were going to enforce that. I, thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> well, no-go zone, is that what your, your thought is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for the uh, I, update. <laughs> I was fortunate to, enough uh, to spend Monday and Tuesday in British Columbia. I know that sounds strange that Wednesday I'm in St. Thomas, but it's true. It was through the night flying. But anyway, it was just amazing to be up there and to see the marinas, drive by the Nanaimo Marina and plenty of space and looks nice and clean. And I was on the ferry. I didn't take my own boat over. And the water was just flat calm. And I thought, why can't it be like that when I come out during the summer? It was just gorgeous. Uh, sun was shining and it just made it that much more exciting that we've, we're gonna have a great summer of being able to go through Canada and up into uh, 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 Alaska. Yeah, well, it's good to be back and uh, thanks for the update. And with that, Let's have Mark and Edo turn on that camera and turn on that speaker and let's welcome him. And I know, Lorena, you want to introduce him and no one can do it better than you can. And I want to remind everybody while you're watching this uh, to be sure and join us in the chat. Uh, Mark's going to do an amazing presentation here. But as you have questions as we're moving along through this, please hit us up in the chat and uh, we'll kind of orchestrate that from here and uh, have some fun with the Q&A. And uh, without further ado, Lorena, I'm hand off to you. Yes, we're so pleased to have Mark with us. We've gotten to know Mark and Edo and out on the water, we've met up in various places, destinations and events and really enjoy his company. And I know you will too. Uh, Mark is retired and he's based in Seattle. He served in senior management positions for large US companies. And in his last position, he was the Senior Vice President of Operations and Customer Service for Amazon. And Mark, spelled with a C, is of French origin, and he named his vessel, his 61-foot Marlow Explorer, La Perouse, after the famous French explorer who, who was here in the Pacific Northwest and explored the coast in 1786. And uh, Mark, Likewise, loves to explore remote places. He's been to Southeast Alaska. He's been along the coast out to Haida Gwaii. And last year when the border was closed, Mark decided, well, I'm gonna head south. And he headed down the coast across the Columbia River Bar, which is no easy feat, up the Columbia through what, eight locks to 
through uh, Columbia River and Snake River, ending in Lewiston, Idaho, and then of course retraced its steps all the way back home again. So welcome, Mark. We're looking forward to uh, learning all about your adventures. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lorena. Uh, let me uh, share my screen here uh, to make sure that everything's working. Okay, so I'm going to take you uh, with me to, uh, to a cruise to Idaho. Um, so because as Lorena said, uh, given that uh, Canada was closed, I decided uh, that I could not go north. You can see my black line just staying south of the border. And I took uh, my boat uh, from Seattle all the way to uh, Lewiston, Idaho. And of course, uh, I took it back because that's the end of navigation. Uh, so here is the boat that I took for this cruise. It's a Marlowe Explorer 61E. As Lorena said, I named my boat after Jean-Francois de Gallo, Comte de la Pérouse, uh, who is a French explorer. It's kind of like the equivalent uh, uh, for France of Captain Cook for England. Uh, he was in our waters from 17, uh, July to September 1786 from Lituya Bay in Alaska all the way down to Monterey in California. Uh, to give you an idea of the size of my boat, which I think is important for that cruise, you can see that my boat is a uh, 60, uh, 68 feet, uh, nearly 19 feet beam. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, a serious yacht. Uh, and an important, two important data when you go in the river, you are going to know uh, what you draw, and I draw 5.2 feet. And another important dimension, which is for this cruise, is the vertical clearance, uh, because uh, I'm going to go under many bridges on the river. And in my case, uh, 29 feet, uh, 26 feet uh, without the VHF antenna. Um, okay, so a few statistics on this cruise. It was a 60 days navigation, uh, plus one day with a jet boat up Hell's Canyon in Idaho. Uh, it was a total of 1,650 nautical miles. Uh, the river route was about 1,000 nautical miles. The sea route was about 650, including 400 nautical miles of open Pacific route uh, from near Bay down to Astoria. Uh, what's interesting in that cruise, which is not common in regular cruise, is that I had an elevation change from sea level to 737 feet elevation in Lewiston, Idaho. I uh, crossed four bars in and out of Grays Harbor, which was my stopover point in the Pacific. And of course, in and out of the famous Columbia Bar. Uh, I did 18 locks, uh, ballard lock, of course, uh, uh, to come in into the sea and back into the lake because my boat is docked in South Lake Union. Uh, I had um, eight locks on the Columbia River, four on the way up and four on the way down and another uh, eight locks on the lower Snake River, four on the way up and four on the way down. And my cruise was kind of separated into six legs, Seattle to Portland, Portland to Kennewick, Kennewick to Lewiston, and then back Lewiston, Kennewick, Kennewick, Portland, and Portland to Seattle. So let me take you on my first leg. Uh, so we left Seattle to go to Nia Bay, that's quite a long uh, leg, 112 nautical mile. Um, usually in summer, uh, the wind blows from the northwest. So I recommend if you do that one day, um, that you use the ebbing tide, uh, which is going to give you two or three free knots uh, in the um, Puget Sound and Admiralty Inlet, and then, uh, and then um, have the flooding tide, which is going to slow you a little, but uh, will put the wind and the tide going together which will make the passage from Port Angeles to Nia Bay much more comfortable because there you begin to be open, especially the last 25 to 30 nautical miles, you begin to be open to some swell from the Pacific. Now, if you do that, just be careful at Point Wilson when you come out of Admiralty Inlet, because if you're still on a ebbing tide, there could be some kind of agitated waters there. Uh, Port Angeles to Nia Bay, which is the last part, is 50 nautical mile, of course. If you go slower, you can stop in Port Angeles one night. It's a very good marina there. 
Nia Bay is an excellent point to prepare for the Pacific part of the cruise. Uh, it's an excellent anchorage, by the way, extremely well protected by a seawall, which uh, just for the fun was built during the Second World War for the US Navy to be able to use that very good port, which was not a very good anchorage until the seawall was built, but became a very good anchorage. And that allowed the U US Navy to have some ships ready in case the Japanese would show up. Uh, there is some fuel available at, at the Maca Marina that was closed during, uh, uh, during the um, COVID, but I believe that Marina is open again. Uh, and it's a very good place to wait. Uh, and if you have to wait a few days, assuming the village is open again, I recommend a visit of the Maca Museum. Okay, so now let's go into the Pacific. Uh, here's a few tips uh, for a safe Pacific passage. So I recommend a stopover. It's a long ways uh, from Nia Bay all the way to Astoria. And the best stopover is clearly in Grace Harbor. Um, La Pouche is also another place, but I would not recommend it. It's a very difficult entrance. Um, so um, Nia Bay to Grace Harbor is 125 nautical miles, and then Grace Harbor to Astoria is 75 nautical miles. Uh, the good news is that, and I highly recommend that, is that you use the crab pot free lanes. Those are published. I found it in a website of the University of Washington. But if you Google crab pot free lanes, you're going to find them. And I traced my routes inside the crab pot free lanes because you know when there is some swell, and we had swell about eight feet, you don't see the crab pots or you see them too late. So it's very important to try to stay in those crab pot free lanes. There are a lot of crab pots uh, in the Pacific. Of course, I recommend to check the weather um, on NOAA and also on the apps you're using, Windy or whatever. Uh, one big recommendation for a leg in the Pacific is to go for the swell height in feet at half the frequency in seconds, which means that you, know, you could go out if it's 10 feet swell, as long as it's every 20 seconds. Of course, um, you know, a six feet swell, for example, every four seconds is much more dangerous and much more uncomfortable than a 10 feet swell every 20 seconds. Um, there is a lot of information regarding the bars. Both um, Grace Harbor has a bar, not very big, um, but of course the famous Columbia bar. Um, the US Coast Guard do um, broadcast every half hour the condition of the bar. Uh, on VHF 22 Alpha, or even better, I recommend that um, website, uh, which gives um, the bar status. Uh, the, never cross the bar during ebbing tides. The ebbing tides will accelerate the flow of water uh, from the Columbia and um, would create, against the swell of the Pacific, some very high waves. So the best uh, for the Columbia bar is that the end of flood uh, the flood does completely slow down the river. In fact, the river doesn't flow during flood. And, and at the end of flood, you have more water in the channel. So this is absolutely the ideal condition. Uh, be careful, the current in the river, in the bar, is 45 to 90 minutes after the tide change. So don't look at the tide table, look at the current tables, which are, which are published for both Grace Harbor and uh, the Columbia Estuary. Um, the good news is that you can get this information in the sea uh, because the internet on the phone is good up to 15, even 20 mi miles out. So you can still get internet, even if you are uh, cruising in the Pacific, which allows you uh, to check the bar condition real time. Okay, so a few pictures of the adventure in the open Pacific. On the left, you see uh, uh, us turning around Cape Flattery and leaving Tatouche Island. Um, behind us. And on the right, you can see our stopover at Westport Marina in Grace Harbor. That marina is just at the entrance, so it's very easy to access. It's a big marina, as you can see, mostly fishing boats and uh, charter fishing boats. Uh, there is very few uh, pleasure boats. You can see my boat um, in the middle of the picture. Um, crossing the bars. All right, so uh, even when the bar is in good condition, uh, it's still impressive because as you can see, outside of the channel, you see those big breakers. 
in the channel, if you add that at the right time, there are no breakers. Um, on the right, you can see the picture of my, the alignment. You can see those two lights on Cape Disappointment. If you align yourself to those, uh, you are in the middle of the channel. The channel is well marked both on the charts and with markers uh, both on the red and green side. Now, there are a lot of boats uh, on the, at the Columbia Bar. Uh, we crossed, as you can see, the, the bar pilot, uh, which is that yellow boat there, who was going out and get one of the cargo ships that come in the Columbia River. And then we also crossed uh, a cargo ship. You can see the size of it. Um, there are some really big cargo ships coming in. We were very lucky we never crossed one in the bar. I would not like to combine the, the waves with the uh, the wake, but uh, this one we crossed in the river. Um, the, as you can see, there are some serious boats coming in. Now, uh, the Columbia Bar is known as the graveyard of the Pacific. Uh, on the right, you can see a picture uh, at the Astoria Maritime Museum of um, the graveyard of the Pacific. 2,000 ships have sunk since 1792. Um, the, the current can go up to seven knots uh, in a spring tide ebbing combined with the flow of the river. So in winter, they have measured waves up to 50 feet uh, during ebbing in winter storms. The navigation channel can be as narrow as 600 feet. The South Jetty, which protects a lot, was built in 1884 and is six miles long. So you can see how big that jetty is. You can see it on the picture on the right. Um, the uh, US Coast Guard Cape Disappointment Station is home to the National Lifeboat School. And that's where the US Coast Guard, the, the Coast Guard uh, tries uh, the, the various boats that they have and they flip them even in the waves to make sure that the boat will um, straighten up. Um, the US Coast Guard still performs today 300 emergency rescues per year. So you see that's nearly one a day. So it's still a serious thing to do, even with all these beautiful jetties uh, that have been built. And then there are 16 certified bar pilots. Uh, they're only available for commercial ships, not for us pleasure boats. But they, these guys come out in all kinds of weather. In fact, at the museum, you're going to see some. If you go to Astoria, even if you don't go with your boat, you go with your car, go and visit the museum there. It's very impressive what these pilots do to board those big ships. Okay, so we're now out of the sea. We are safe in Astoria, uh, in the West Basin Marina on the left, you can see my boat. And in the background, you can see the famous Astoria Bridge, which connects Oregon in the South to Washington State in the North. On the right, you can see the view, and I recommend to go up there from the Astoria column uh, you can see the view of the estuary. It's kind of impressive. In fact, I'm sure you can see on that, that, uh, you know, the, the, the bridge is for the big ships to come in. That's the channel. But you can see that next to the channel, there is these huge sandbars. So it's kind of impressive to think that those cargo ships uh, go next to these uh, very shallow waters. Okay, so the next step, once uh, <clears throat> you're in Astoria, is to go to Portland. Uh, so before you leave um, Astoria, once again, I recommend the visit of the Marine Museum, the Maritime Museum and the Astoria Column. Uh, in that part of the river, the channel, which is extremely well marked, is guaranteed at 40 feet depth because of those big ships. So clearly there is no problem for any, any of our pleasure boats. But there are some nice marinas between Astoria and Portland. Uh, in Catlamet, the entrance is pretty narrow, but it's okay get about eight feet depth. And St. Helens, which is a very, very nice um, uh, town harbor, um, very, very, very pleasant uh, little village to visit. Uh, we even anchored once in Fair Island, which is about here. And it was kind of a, the first time that I had this, this strange thing happening. You know, as, as you, you, many of you I'm sure have anchored uh, with your boats, and you usually anchor and you make sure that, uh, you know, you put the anchor and then the wind, um, uh, you go behind the anchor, the wind blows you in the front. So I was, you know, my usual thing, the wind was blowing about 25 mile knots from the wind, from the west. So I anchored that way. And here my boat turned. Indeed, the current 
which was about an, one and a half knots there, was stronger on my boat than 25 knots wind. And so really I got the, the boat turning and I had to reset a little my anchor until I understood what was going on. There is also a nice alternate um, channel at the end when you arrive near Portland, south of St. Helens, uh, you can take the Multnomah Channel before Portland. It's okay. Uh, there is a, the entrance is a, just south of St. Helens, is marginal for depth, like six feet, six and a half feet. But after that, it's good, and it's a beautiful way to enter Portland. Uh, the next um, uh, part of the of the cruise was Portland to Kennewick. Uh, that's 119 nautical miles, by the way. I'm also giving you the statute miles because on the river, all the distance on the charts are in statute miles. So not like in the sea. Um, so that's uh, uh, those 100 219 miles from Portland to the Tri-City, Pasco, Kirk, uh, Richland and Kennewick. Um, the channel after Portland is guaranteed at 14 feet depth all the way to Lewiston. So there is no problem in the channel. Um, it's a little more complex when you leave the channel and you try to either anchor or access a marina where you have to be really careful uh, with the depth because the depth on the charts are not completely guaranteed. Uh, as you know, it's a river, so therefore there can be some movement of the, of the sandbars. And so uh, you, you gotta be really careful with, with the depth. Uh, I recommend a great stop at Beacon Rock, Washington State Park. So this is the last time I'm going to stop on the Washington side uh, for a while. Uh, then the first lock at Bonneville arrives. And then you have the next three locks, Dal, John Day, and McNary. I'm going to speak about that a little more. Um, as far as Marina is concerned, the concern after Bonneville, there is a port of Cascade Marina. It's a very narrow entrance with a little current from the river. So you gotta be careful. And then the problem is from outside, you cannot see if there is space on the uh, transient dock. And there is no, no harbor master there. So it, the only way to know is to go in and hope that you have some space. And we were lucky we did. Uh, Port of Hood River uh, is the next big thing. It's a, a famous place. It's a wind tunnel um, on the river uh, with uh, uh, wind blowing up to 50 knots. And so it's, it's a world famous place for kite surfers. So be careful with these guys, they are all over the place. And then uh, inside the harbor uh, at Hood River, uh, for my boat, um, the docks were too small, but um, I could use the uh, cruise boat dock in the harbor. Uh, the Dallas Marina is the next one. It's a superb marina, extremely welcoming people. It's a nice village to visit. I highly recommend it. And then after that, it becomes a little more touch and go. And there is two places, the Port of Arlington, and Boardman Marina Park. Um, the, the draft is just okay, eight feet. Um, very friendly marinas, very friendly people. Uh, but the little problem with those is that they are, the Union Pacific Railroad tracks are just in the back of where you are docked. So um, you, you're gonna see a lot of train and hear a lot of train pass. Uh, and then finally, uh, we arrived at um, Kennewick and there there is a, a place called Clover Island uh, there are several marinas there, and there is also a yacht club. And I was fortunate that yacht club had a reciprocal with the Seattle Yacht Club to which I belong. All right, the next part of the cruise was Kennewick to Lewiston uh, and Clarkston. Uh, that's uh, 138 statute miles on the lower Snake River. Uh, and now this is very remote part. There is very few marinas, there is only one. Uh, and then after that, it's camping grounds. Uh, but it's an incredibly beautiful part of the world. Um, so in Kennewick, you turn uh, into the Lower Snake River. The only marina is Lions Ferry Marina. All the rest are camping ground. Uh, there is, after the first dam, Ice Harbor, uh, there is two parks. Fishhook Park is eight feet. Uh, Charbonneau is the another park. And this one was, looked to me like less than six feet anyway. I chickened out and I did not get in into that one. Uh, then. After a later, further up the river, before Lewiston, there is Boyer Park, which is a great camping ground, super nice. Um, the entrance to the marina is a bit touchy for me at six feet, 
but there is a dock on the river where the cruise boat dock, but usually there is space there. Um, there are four dams uh, on the lower snake, uh, and I'm going to come back to how you cross those dams and what they are. And then an absolute visit, which I'm going to show you some pictures, the Palouse River waterfall. Uh, that's in Lions Ferry Marina. You can try to um, find somebody that will take you with a car to go and see it because it's about 20 miles in the desert, but it's, it's an absolute uh, visit to do. Um, then you arrive at the top at the end of navigation. There, is, there are no marinas um, on the Lewiston side. It's only commercial uh, docks there. But um, on the uh, south side, uh, i.e. the Washington side of the river, uh, there is a port of Clarkson dock uh, where the people are very nice and, and will welcome you. Okay, so now let me share a few pictures. I think one of the characteristic of this cruise was of course the fact that um, the, the landscape changes completely uh, between when you are west of the Cascades and then east of the Cascades, east of the volcanoes. So on the left, you can see what it, how it looks from Astoria to Hood River, the usual thing that we are used to in, in Seattle and, and as we go up inside passage. But then once you are east of Hood River, you're now in semi-desertic landscape, as you can see on the picture. It's kind of interesting to know that as you sail east of Hood River, you lose one inch of rain per year per mile. <coughs> so in 40 miles, you go from a, uh, our usual wet climate to, um, to a, a completely semi-desertic climate. Uh, you go from waterfalls uh, on the Columbia Gorge, which is between Portland and Bonneville Dam, uh, and this is the famous Multnomah Falls, uh, to monumental rocks um, on the Snake River. Again, incredible difference of landscape as you go east. You go from total calm to 50 knot winds. So on the left, you have a picture of the Snake River early in the morning at Fishhook Park. It's absolutely beautiful. And you can see there is not a ripple on the river. And then on the other side, uh, this is a picture of the Columbia River at Hood River. You see one of these kite surfers. And uh, the wind was blowing about 38 knots uh, when I was there. Um, we, uh, we, we were there. Uh, as you perhaps remember, we had a heat wave last year, including in Seattle uh, and in Portland. And so the day of that famous heat wave, I was in the Dalles, Oregon. And you can see uh, my display there with air temperature as 115.2 degrees Fahrenheit, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, you can see that the minimum air when I was in the Pacific was 47.7. So I guess we, we, we went up 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, what was amazing also is that on June 30, I, two days after being in the middle of that heat wave, we drove up to uh, Mount Hood, uh, a ski resort called Timberline, which is at 6,000 6, feet elevation. And there were some skiers there. So it was kind of amazing to go from 115 degrees Fahrenheit to a ski resort. Uh, this is the beautiful homes near Portland. Uh, on the left side, you can see the floating homes on the Multnomah Channel. And then on the right picture, uh, you see p uh, houses on shore on the Vancouver, Washington side. Uh, I suspect that some well-off Oregon people go and live on the Washington side, given that we do not have income tax. Um, all sorts of farming uh, along the river. On the left, you see two types of farming. Uh, first, of course, um, the wines, uh, um, the American viticultural area of uh, Columbia Valley. And then on top of the hill, uh, at Mary Hill, you can see another type of farming, which is wind farming. Uh, there is a lot of wind along the river coming from the west. And so you can see that it's a great place to establish wind farms. But there is also a bit of more traditional farming thanks to the irrigation from the river, even in the semi-desertic climate. Um, and you can see here cattle grazing at Scheffler on the Snake River. Now, this cruise is also famous for being the Three Volcanoes Cruise. Um, as um, 
you come in uh, first from St. Helens, you can see Mount St. Helens very well. Uh, you can see the little piece up there uh, that blew up in May 1980 when that volcano erupted. And then Mount Adams, um, which is closer to the river. And then of course, the most famous of all, Mount Hood. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, what you see when you drive up to Mount Hood from Hood River. And on the right, this is what you can see at the John Day Dam looking west and Mount Hood, which is 50 miles from where, you, where I am right now, still dominates the landscape completely. So it gives you an idea of the size of that incredible volcano. Now, the other thing which is very special also from a geographical point of view is the impact of the Missoula floods. You perhaps have heard about the fact that during the last glaciation period <clears throat> in 15, uh, 50, about uh, 15,000 before Christ, um, there was a major ice age. And up in what is today Montana and Idaho, there was an enormous lake which was formed uh, by an ice dam. And then when uh, the ice age finished, the ice melted and there was an enormous flood. <coughs> in fact, they think several times, which totally changed the landscape. And that's the kind of landscape you get. Uh, the Palouse River waterfall, which are, by the way, the Washington State waterfall, are in the middle of a desertic land and you can see this beautiful river coming down. And then you can see the canyon of the Palouse River. That's about 20 miles uh, upriver from the point where the Palouse River merges into the Snake River. The other impact that you can see very well during the cruise of the Missoula flood is what's called the Walula Gap. Uh, this, um, the gap restricted the flow of the floods and created a lake 1300 feet deep in the Pasco Basin. So around Pasco, can we, uh, the, the, it's kind of a flat land. And then you, when you go uh, west, you enter that very narrow gap here that you can see on the left. And it also created some very strange, because of the flood, which took all the dirt out and created some very interesting rock formations, such as the twin sister rocks, there's a beautiful Cayuse Indian legend about those two sisters, which I recommend you, you read online. It's kind of fun. Okay, so what is the traffic on the river? Well, there's two major traffic, uh, the big barge. So those big um, cargo ships that I showed you uh, before Portland unload uh, their goods, mostly imports from Asia uh, onto those barge. Uh, those barges are pushed, as you can see, not pulled. It's not a tugboat, it's a pusher boat. And uh, those barges uh, then are pushed all the way to Lewiston, Idaho, um, where they are loaded, where the goods are loaded on, on trucks and trains. Um, and then on the way back down, the barge load a lot of grains and wood products um, that are exported uh, by Oregon and Washington State uh, to Asia. Uh, and so that's the traffic on the river. Uh, the traffic is not enormous, but we, we saw about, you know, perhaps one barge every two days or perhaps, you know, sometimes two barge a day. And then of course the other big boats um, on the river are these river cruise boats. And you can see here one of them, American Harmony, I believe, or American Dream, um, and uh, American Song, sorry. Um, and um, you can see that's a, that's a serious cruise boat. Uh, those cruise boats offer cruise from Astoria all the way to Lewiston, Idaho. And then the other boats, I don't have any picture of them, it's all just small um, ski boats or fishing boats. And then the other people, the, the other elements which are present all the time along the cruise is um, are the trains. Uh, on the left side, you can see the train on the south side of the river, Oregon side. Uh, that's Union Pacific on that side. Uh, there's about 35 trains a day. Uh, and some trains are very long. We counted trains with more than 120 cars. And then on the right, you can see one of the connection between the train network on the north of the river, which is uh, uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Uh, that's um, the company that goes to Seattle. Um, and then there is a bridge which connects the north and the south. 
Uh, this is the Lyons Ferry Railroad Bridge. Um, it, when it was built in 1912, uh, it was the longest and highest railroad bridge in the world. Now, beyond the boats and the trains, there is all sorts of animal life. On the left, you can see elks at the beach. This picture was taken uh, before Bonneville Dam. Um, and then on the right, you can see some cows at the beach. Um, that's very much taken in the Snake River where the climate is very dry, but you can see those cows are enjoying a cool, cool bath in the river and some of them are just lying on the beach there. There is a lot of bird life. On the left, you can see the osprey, uh, which were watching over every navigation markers, practically uh, marking the channel. Uh, there were ospreys nests all over. And then uh, to my surprise, because I did not completely know that pelicans were river birds. So you can see here some pictures of pelicans on one of the islands uh, on the river. Of course, the fish life. So beautiful trouts and traditional fish in the rivers. But on the right is perhaps less traditional. Um, there are sturgeon in the river, both the snake and the Columbia. And uh, this one, um, the picture was taken in a hatchery uh, aquarium uh, in Bonneville, <coughs> Bonneville hatchery. And this uh, fish is 80 years old <coughs> and weighs 450 pounds. Quite a fish. It's a sturgeon. As you know, they look very strange, kind of prehistoric type of animals. And of course, the salmon. On the left, uh, you can see one of the fish ladder. This is the one at Bonneville. That's where the adult salmon come back uh, and avoid the, the, the dam by going up uh, those fish ladders. On the right, you see how the little fish, um, how do they go down? So um, they have their own cruise boats. Um, uh, it's very difficult for the little fish because the, the, the legs are too slow for them and the legs between dams. And so most of the little fish that are born in hatcheries uh, are transported by these barges uh, down all the way below Bonneville Dam, where they are released uh, to go to the sea. A few facts, of course, on, on preserving the salmon runs. As you know, this, there is a lot of arguments about the impact of the dams on the salmon. So here is a few, uh, a few facts. Uh, the Lower Snake River Compensation Program, there is a network of nine hatcheries on the Columbia Snake and Salmon River all the way to Stanley Idaho, um, where, um, where in fact, I'm nearly speaking to you about, I'm in Idaho myself right now in Sun Valley. And um, there is a hatchery in Stanley Idaho um, and there are salmon coming back. And so those salmon that come back all the way to Stanley Idaho, they come through the Columbia, then the Snake, and then halfway Hell's Canyon, they turn left on the Salmon River, which has no dams. And they, all, they come all the way back to Stanley Idaho and it is the highest in elevation salmon run in the world. At the end, they are at 7,000 feet altitude uh, over 900 miles. Imagine what a, what a, a travel that is. Um, at the time, you can see the salmon counts. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is, is responsible of trying to maintain that. Um, so here is the count for the Chinook or, or King Salmon uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, Bonneville, which is the first time, sees between 400,000 to 1.5 million Chinook uh, coming up the fish ladder every year. Uh, two thirds of it continue on the Columbia, one third turn on the snake. And so at my last dam, which is a lower granite just before Lewiston, uh, there is about 50 to 200,000 king salmon uh, coming up the fish ladder. The other exciting part of that cruise is, of course, we are on the footsteps of Lewis and Clark. Uh, so we visited several uh, museums and, and display area uh, of the Lewis and Clark cruise, uh, Lewis and Clark travel. You can see the type of canoe they use on the left. Imagine this was a dugout of a trunk tree, of a trunk of a tree. Imagine the weight of this, and they had to carry it several times because of course, when Lewis and Clark came down and then back up the Columbia and Lower Snake, uh, they, uh, it was not navigable at the time. 
and there was uh, rapids, uh, and the rapids were very dangerous, and and they had to, of course, portage their um, canoe uh, when when there was a rapid. In fact, it's kind of fun. I, I, I there is a rapid at Port of Cascade. We know that was that's why it's called Port of Cascade, and it's kind of interesting because when I was with my boat, and I saw um, as we were going down. You know, there was about 40 feet depth and suddenly there's 110 feet depth. So you knew that's where the rapids used to be, where the waterfall was. And then on the right is a beautiful statue of Sakajawea showing us the way for the cruise. And then, um, and then the other thing I did not know about, in fact, I learned that uh, uh, in, uh, this is a picture at Port of Cascade, uh, that the Lewis and Clark had a dog with them called Seaman, uh, which they, Bought in Pittsburgh, um, and was a, a very useful companion, hunter, guard dog, um, and even uh, caught a deer in Mid River one time. Uh, it was a, a, a large Newfoundland uh, dog, so it was dog used to rough seas. Okay, so where do we spend the night? Well, mo mostly uh, in uh, accessible marinas. So on the left, uh, this is the narrow entrance of the Port of Cascade Marina. Uh, unfortunately, you've got to be very careful when you enter because there's current. But on top of that, it's quite narrow and you don't see if the transient dock has space and there is no harbor master. So you have to, uh, you have to go in and hope. And we were lucky both times. Uh, there was space on uh, the transient dock is on the right of this picture, you can't see it. And then on the right, uh, you can see another much Better, much bigger, much more open uh, marina called uh, at the Dalles. Most of their, uh, as you can see, the, the, the resident boats are all covered uh, because there is a lot of sun. And so it would it's clearly would damage the boats. And you can see where I was docked. And you can see the other boats are all like ski boats. So I can tell you that when we arrive, we're always popular people coming to see us. Okay, so then when, as I said, when you go up the Snake River, then there is really no no more marinas, uh, but there are camping ground where you can come in. And on the, on the left, this is Fishwood Park. Beautiful, you can see where I am docked. There is a dock there. I had to tiptoe my way, but uh, there was never less than eight feet deep, uh, easy entrance. And once we were in, it was very good protection. And it was fun to be in a camping ground. You can see on the right, another one. This is an absolutely superb camping ground. Um, this one is called Boyer Park. It's about 40 miles before Lewiston. Uh, and on Friday, there was free music. There's a beautiful beach there. Uh, and you can see where I am moored. I, I could not come in the marina, which is on the right. You can see it on the picture because the depth was just absolutely borderline for me. But um, I had called and they said there is no cruise boat dock, at, cruise boat at the dock outside, which is the cruise boat dock. So you're welcome to stop there, which I did. And you can see my boat is docked in the river out there. Um, sometimes uh, we had to really use the cruise boat docks. So on the left, you see uh, the picture of my boat at Hood River. Um, and uh, that was a, uh, the cruise boat dock. Uh, and there was no cruise boat. And the port of Hood River told me that I could come in. And um, the only problem is that the um, power for this cruise boat dock is power is on, on the shore. And so you needed a very long cable. And then on the right, is, I'm literally sharing the dock with American Harmony, one of these big cruise boats in the port of Clarkston. I'm inside the dock and uh, American Harmony is outside. Uh, the other advantage is there are some very nice hospitable yacht clubs uh, we would, uh, we which had, uh, I had a reciprocal with the Seattle Yacht Club. On the left, um, we had dinner at the Portland Yacht Club, which I highly recommend if you have a reciprocal. It's, it's a wonderful place and the restaurant is beautiful and, and the beautiful view of, of the docks. And then on the right uh, is um, the Clover Island Yacht Club. These people were absolutely fantastic. Uh, I had to go to, to Europe for, uh, to see um, my mother. And um, I so therefore I, I left my boat there for two weeks and they, the whole yacht club looked after my boat. It was fantastic. Uh, it was the safest place to put the boat. It was just to enter, as you can see, uh, but there was just enough water for me and, and they let me stay there for two weeks, which was absolutely wonderful. 
those people at the Clover Island Yacht Club, uh, the most hosp um, the hospitality people that I know. And we even anchored, uh, uh, this is one picture of an anchorage called Miller Island. Uh, that's on the Columbia River, uh, halfway kind of between Portland and Kennewick. Um, I anchored in 52 feet depth. Uh, there was a little current, uh, but the advantage there is um, uh, that I was protected there is, as you can see, by this enormous cliff from the west winds. So it was really very, very good anchorage, good holding, protected from the uh, from the wind from the west. And then um, on the left, you can see those islands there, and that's some of the pictures you saw of the pelicans. That's where they live on these islands, which are a bird sanctuary. Okay, the bridges. Uh, so 21 bridges, uh, all sorts of bridges, freeway, highway or railroad. Uh, here's two pictures, one on the left is the Bridge of the Gods. Uh, of course, this is the new Bridge of the Gods. It's a beautiful uh, First Nation legend uh, that uh, during the old days, uh, there was a, a major earthquake and uh, a lot of uh, rocks fell down from the Washington side and really created a bridge over the Columbia River. And it's known as the Bridge of the Gods. It's also where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses the Columbia River. Um, on the right, it's one of the rail four railroad bridges where I had to call uh, to open uh, the um, clearance when the bridge is down. You can see on the left, uh, it's very little, something like eight feet or three feet, no, I don't know, five feet. And so you have to call. Um, all, all the bridges have a phone number and uh, also can be contacted on VHF 13. And then you wait for him to open and he opens and you go under. The dams, okay, so here are the four dams of the Columbia. The first one, Bonneville, which was um, began during the uh, New Deal and was inaugurated by President Franklin Roosevelt himself. The height of the dam is 197 feet. The lock is 90 feet and it produces 1190 megawatt of power. The Dalles was built in 1957. The height is 260 feet, the lock is 90 feet, and it produces 2,038 megawatt. To give you an idea, that's enough to supply the whole power to King County, uh, which tells you the importance of those dams in terms of hydropower for our part of the world. The one on the bottom left is John Day, 1971. Height at 184 feet. The lock at 113 feet is the highest lock lift in the world. And it produces 2,485 megawatts. And finally, McNary, built in 1954. The height is 183 feet. The lock 75 feet produces 1,133 megawatts. And then the Snake River, there are four more dams, Ice Harbor, uh, 1961, Loka 100 feet, uh, Lower Monumental 69, Little Goose 1970, and Lower Granite 1975. They all are about, locks are about 100 feet. They all produce about 900 megawatt because um, only half the power plant has been equipped with turbines, but there is a reserve of power there if we want to, if we need to, and we could have to need to if we all begin to drive electric cars. And we could double the power of all these uh, power plants. Okay, that's what you see when you visit one of these dams. This is Bonneville. This is the power plant and the spillway. The spillway is pretty impressive, as you can see. Uh, the four missions of the dams, when they were established, uh, was hydropower, irrigation, recreation, and you saw some of the camping. Um, Ground irrigation, you saw some of the cows uh, having a, a good time along the river. Um, and then um, and navigation. So let's speak about navigation. Well, the dams uh, are, if every dam is associated with a lock, which allows you to go uh, from below the dam to above the dam and on the way back down from above the dam to below the dam. And that's the uh, total elevation you can see at the end, thanks to those dams you arrive at 738 um, feet above uh, uh, mean uh, water level uh, at the estuary. So 
uh, that's that's quite a climb. So a few lock navigation tips. Um, be careful when you approach or you leave uh, the lock because uh, as you could see from the picture, the spillways can be quite powerful and there are a lot of current um, when you come in. In fact, I had up to seven knots of current against me approaching uh, the dam. Um, okay, now once you're inside the locks, uh, you can only tie to one floating bollard. And the reason for that is that the bollards are too far from each other. They've been built for those huge barges that you saw on the picture. And so the next bollard is like 200 feet ahead of you. So there's no way you can use two bollards. So now uh, you kind of have a strange thing to be, which is you only tie to one place. So we use three lines, midship, bow spring, and stern spring um, to tie the boat which is fine because um, you know, the boat is not gonna move forward and backwards, but the boat does rotate. And so you are forced to use bow and stern thrusters uh, to keep the boat parallel to the wall. And I recommend to have a bow and stern thruster when you do that. If not, you'll have to hold the boat uh, with um, uh, some, some form of, a, of, 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 of stick to, to try to keep the, the boat from moving against the wall. Uh, you're supposed to wear life jackets, at least uh, some lock master uh, instruct that. I mean, you know, from our boat, it didn't make much sense, but um, they're kind of saying, oh, you're a pleasure boat. Of course, they're mostly used to ski boats, which is a little different. Uh, I recommend to protect your fenders with construction bags uh, because the walls of the lock are not very clean. Um, and we even use on top of that, uh, two by six, six feet long boards between the fender and the wall as an additional protection. Uh, the lockmaster, you can contact them by phone. They all have a phone number um, to, to say, you know, I'm coming tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Is that okay? And then when you can speak to them when you arrive uh, with VHF 40. And there is a recreation boat schedule uh, that I recommend you adhere to. This is how it looks. When you come in, uh, this is the spillway and the current approaching John Day. And you can see here, this is where I'm going to come in. This is a guillotine door. That's the entrance to the lock, that big black hole there. And that's how it looks once you begin to get closer and you enter these enormous locks. And that's how it looks on the, on the right. And then once you're in, you see that the guillotine door is now closing behind me. And these are the three lines which are attached to the floating bollard that I told you about. This bollard is going to float up with you, good thing, because there's 100 feet difference. Uh, and there is three lines. Um, they, um, one of the things for safety that you make sure that uh, you have somebody mending those lines uh, like that in case the floating bollard doesn't float, uh, you can immediately release the line. If not, it would take you down. Um, on the left, you can see um, my uh, very elegant uh, garbage, uh, uh, bags protecting my, my fenders. Uh, you can even see the, also that, that piece of wood here that I put to protect the fenders. Um, and we're going up and then when you finish to go up, it's so nice, you're 100 feet up and you come out of that kind of tunnel you were in and you arrive at the surface and, and uh, you've gone 100 feet and now yeah, it's 50 miles or 40 miles until the next dam. Uh, you can see uh, on the way back, uh, you can see here the schedule uh, going upstream. Uh, the river is open for the dams are open for recreation craft uh, at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m., 6 p.m., 9 p.m., and downstream 9:30, 12:30, etc. Uh, remember that schedule. Uh, they will not open for you if if you don't come at that time. If there is a big barge, a commercial barge, of course, they will go before you. Uh, some dam. Some lock keepers are very nice. Of course, we showed up early every time because you don't want to miss it. And sometimes they let me go at 8.30 a.m. in the morning um, when we arrive for the 9 a.m. going up. Some others just insisted that we waited for the, for the right time. And of course, entering on the way down is much less impressive because you enter from the top lake uh, into the dam, as you can see on the right. And that's a uh, low granite, that's the dam at 
the top the top dam so this one is at uh, i'm at elevation 737 feet at that moment uh, when you go down it's kind of impressive when those gates open you can see here uh, regular gates not not guillotine gates a little goose and then i was telling you about that current uh, this is south of bonneville um, this is my speed over water 9.4 knots this is my speed over ground 15.9 so there was 6.5 knots of current pushing me because of the spillway at bonneville we made it to idaho um, on the right, you can see the welcome to Clarkston, which is in Washington state, on the Washington side of the river. But we did navigate into Idaho. Uh, this is my Garmin chart plotter. And you can see here, uh, my boat is here, and this is the border, and this is Idaho. But then I had to go back about here uh, to Port of Clarkston because there is no marina available for pleasure boat uh, on the Idaho side. And then um, from there, we uh, chartered a jet boat because there, that's it from my boat is finished. And we went up 57 miles up Hell's Canyon, which is the Snake River. Um, so you see the Snake River from a navigable river becomes this incredible river. Um, that um, a jet boat uh, at 30 knots draw only five inches uh, because it really flies over the water nearly. Uh, Hell's Canyon is a beautiful place. Very few people know that it's in fact the deepest river gorge um, uh, in, in, um, in North America. Uh, it's deeper than the Grand Canyon at nearly 8,000 feet, which is amazing. Okay, so to conclude, uh, this is the navigational achievements of this cruise. I doubled uh, Cape Alava, uh, which is the most Western point of the continental US. Cape Flattery is not. Cape Alava is about 10 nautical miles south of Cape Flattery. And it is the most western point of the continental United States at 123 degrees, 43 minutes, 59 seconds west. I navigated to Lewiston, which is the furthest from the sea in the west coast and the highest elevation seaport of the United States. The definition of a seaport is that you can clear customs, which is what those barges do because they unload uh, the goods from the cargo ships between before Portland, and then they bring all the cargo to Lewiston, and that's where they clear customs. So Lewiston is a seaport of the United States. I believe that I am the boat that the highest elevation boat of, of all the Seattle Yacht Club boats, that's to be checked uh, because I went up to 737 feet. I also, another interesting navigation point, I reached the most Eastern navigable position on the West Coast of the USA. Um, the uh, longitude of Lewiston is 117 degrees, two minutes West. And the, Me the, the Mexican border is 117 minutes, therefore slightly more West. Therefore, this is the most Eastern navigable position on the West Coast of the United States. To conclude, let me just uh, recommend here a few readings in case you are interested in doing this adventure. Uh, these are the readings that inspired me and also guided me. Uh, the famous article that Tony Fleming published in Passage Maker um, uh, about two years ago. Uh, Tony went with Venture, which is a Fleming 65 which of course helped me a lot because his boat is exactly the same length and, and draft as mine. Uh, there is also a lot of information in uh, James and Jennifer Hamilton blog uh, on the mvdirona.com um, where they, they went uh, up the Columbia River and the Snake in 2012. Um, there was an article in both US Magazine in December 2019, the Columbia River Cruising Guide, uh, there is an article in Northwest Yachting in, again, April 2009, Let the River Run. And then there is a Sea Magazine article in January 2019 called Locks and All. And I recommend that if ever you want to do this, um, I recommend that you read this. This is what I wanted to share with you. 
And I hope that many of you will have the opportunity to do this with your boat, or if you can't do it with your boat, at least take your car along the Columbia River. It's worth a visit. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. What a presentation. Um, you know, a couple of questions came in and, and now would be a great time to submit questions if you have them. Um, one of them was a very basic question on fuel uh, heading up river. Is it hard to find? I mean, did you have any issues with that? Uh, no, I mean, I, I carry um, 15, 1,600 gallons, which gives me a lot of autonomy. Uh, I did fill up on the river uh, in Kennewick, no problem. There was fuel there. Uh, there is not much fuel on the uh, on the snake, so I would recommend to fill up in Kennewick, um, and and then have enough. You should have enough fuel to go up to Kenne up to Lewiston and back down. Along the Columbia, there is in the marinas, there is several places where there is fuel, and there is fuel in Portland also, and of course in Astoria. Mike Schmidt has a question. Says, uh, can a boat doing a speed of seven knots do part of this cruise? I believe it could be doable. The, the, the problem would be uh, that when you approach a dam on the way up, you will have to uh, slalom to avoid the main flow of the spillway. But if you go on the side uh, or you know of the river, there is less current there. But I believe that would be the big challenge as I said, I mean, but my boat is powerful enough, so that was not a problem for me. Um, but I did measure seven knots of current against me in the middle of the river. Uh, however, you know, the, the way that, that, that river, that, that flow of water flows is not regular, so it's not seven knots everywhere. But uh -huh. it would be a challenge uh, below the dam. But at least you can go all the way to Bonneville and then back. Yeah. And when you anchored in the river too, I, I th thought that was interesting. Um, one of the questions was how much chain and road, you know, do you need or would you need anchoring? And I know it's gonna depend where you're anchoring obviously, but but uh, you look pretty well protected there when you did anchor. Yeah, I mean, I carry a lot of, of chain and anchor because I go to Alaska, et cetera. So I have 400 feet of chain, so I'm well equipped. Of course, I didn't need all that. Um, as I said, it was kind of interesting. The first anchorage I did because I'm used to anchor with my my uh, bow in the wind. <laughs> you know, as soon as I re you know we put the anchor released, oh, the current turned me. <laughs> so I was going with the wind, and you know, you never anchor with having the wind in the cockpit, but that was the case because uh, the the current is stronger than the wind usually. Uh, the current, of course, is east west. The wind is west east. Um, so it's kind of interesting. However. Um, you know, where I anchored, uh, the, you know, there was really no problem. The first time I anchored, it was about 40 feet. And then the second time was like 50 feet. And, and there is a lot of sand and stuff at the bottom. So it's excellent holding um, in the river. So it's really, I don't think a problem. Uh, you have to be careful with the wind coming from the west. Right? So um, that will position your boat, you know, because you, you always calculate your circle, et cetera. And, and I had a shock and I, oh my God, okay, my boat is going the other way. I've got to be careful about that. Yeah, you're obviously very well prepared. You're very experienced, but was there something on this journey that you learned that you weren't aware of or, you know, what, what was it that maybe surprised you? Well, there is, you know, you, on a boat, you always learn. There is always something that happens that is not per plan. Um, I, uh, I think the, the first surprise was the one I just told you, which was, oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm anchoring with my bow in the wind and the boat turns. I mean, that's not normal, right? Uh, that's perhaps the, the number one surprise. Uh, I was super careful uh, regarding the, the bars, right? Uh, and, you know, we, we, we calculated this in, in really detail. So for example, we left um, Grace Harbor, uh, at just the beginning of flood in order not to have breakers in the bar, because even Grace Arbor has that. Uh, and I've calculated that at the speed I can go, I would arrive uh, in the Columbia bar at the, um, at, the, at the end of flood, which is the moment you really want to cross the Columbia bar. Um, but we were not completely sure. And when we left Grace Arbor, 
uh, because the tide is not exactly the same. Uh, Columbia Bar was still yellow. There are four states of the Columbia Bar. Black, which means close to everybody, even the big guys. Red, which is like only the big guys. Yellow, which is okay for a boat like mine, but still not fun. And then green, which is open to any boat. And when we left Grays Harbor, uh, the Columbia Bar status was yellow. And then uh, about an hour before, and as I said, you, you, we could see the, the website because there was uh, phone coverage everywhere, even in you know, 10 miles out in the Pacific. And we saw that thing turn green. And we said, oh my God, that feels good. That said, when we entered, there was still six to eight feet in the beam. Wow. And uh, what I recommend, sorry, not in the beam, in the back. Um, or just when we turn in the beam and then in the back. Um, I'm fortunate because my boat can go, it's a semi-displacement hull. So I can go up to 16, 17 knots if I want to. Um, and I recommend to do that. The, the swell of the Pacific travels at 20 feet, at 20 knots. And so if you go 17, it only hits you at three. So you have plenty of time to correct. If you go slower than that, so for the boats, we had the question on boat that goes seven knots. Um, yeah, I mean, they're going to get, you know, the wave from the back coming at mm -hmm. 13 knots. So they've got to be very aware and very much on the wheel to keep the boat from broaching. Yeah. Well, uh, so many great comments pouring in. Everybody loved this presentation. We could probably continue for another hour, but we we don't have time for that. But uh, we really appreciate you joining us. And I mean, what a journey it's going to be. I mean, what a great way for us to start this series. I can't think of a better way to start it. And we appreciate you uh, sharing all of this with us. Well, it's, it's, it's my pleasure to share that. I, you know, I, I enjoy doing this and I'm fortunate to be able to do it. And I, I love uh, uh, sharing it. In fact, I'm going to give this pitch again at, at the Seattle Yacht Club in about a month's time to, to my friends at the Yacht Club. Uh, because, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like the flip side of COVID where we could not go to Canada. It kind of, you know, made it possible for me saying, okay, I, instead of staying put in the Puget Sound, I'm going to go and try to do it. Once again, you know, I, I re highly recommend, and that's why I gave all these readings. Um, if you, if people want to do it, they really have to prepare. This is not your normal going to the to Friday Harbor and back type of cruise, right? Uh, yeah. There is there is the 200 nautical miles or nearly in the Pacific, which is serious. I was very lucky, by the way, because, as you know, uh, in winter, in summer, sorry, uh, most of the, the dominant wind are from the northwest, so is the swell. So on the way south, it was easy in a way because you get the wind and the, and the swell in the back. I was a little concerned about going back up. Uh, we all know, and many people have done, I think Mark Benzel has done it. I think Lorena Leonard have done it. Going up along the coast is never, never very fun going north. It can be rough. Um, and um, I was kind of concerned, you know, about you know, how is it going to be? And uh, I got to say that I was so lucky. Uh, the, the weather forecast, when, when we looked at it on the, um, when we were in, um, in Grays Harbor to the long, you know, 125 nautical mile, the weather forecast was winds two knot gusting at four, swell four feet every 15 seconds. So it was like a paradise. I was so lucky on the way back. So uh, I, that I cannot guarantee to everybody. So this is a serious thing and, and you have to really prepare and you know, be ready to wait three, four, five days in Astoria if needed or, or in Grace Harbor uh, because this is serious sea out there. Yeah. One last question. Bonus question. Where to next? Where to uh, my... <laughs> My next one is uh, I'm going to Skagway. I'm going to All do right. the, I'm going to, uh, you know, do the gold rush with the train, you know? <laughs> the Yukon gold rush. I'm going to Skagway this year. Mark That's and great. I, we have talked about journeying together across the Gulf of Alaska, right, Mark? And we still have that's, that. Uh, yeah, that's one, uh, that's one plan. That's my kind of ultimate plan to go to Prince William Sound, perhaps with yeah. you one day because there is a little detail there. There is 400 nautical miles of crossing the Gulf of Alaska, which is a small issue. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff, great stuff. Mark, thank you for joining us. And before we go, uh, I want uh, 
Leonard and Lorena to give us a preview of our next episode. I know we're going to kind of alternate between news and notes and uh, having adventurous, exciting, and interesting information, but uh, what's coming up next time? That's right. So uh, next Thursday, we call uh, our alternating program, Wagoner Webcast Lite, and we'll be focusing on updates for marinas. Marinas are gearing up and getting ready for the boating season, and we'll be talking about what's open, what's closed, what to expect, and uh, it's going to be a busy season. That's so we, great. Hope, we, we invite everybody to join back next week. Uh, we'll be on here Thursday night. Something for you to do at 7 p.m. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a good night. Thank you again. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Thanks, Mike.